You'd be hard-pressed to find another city with as many cranes in the air as Ontario's capital. And yet, no matter how much is built, it doesn't seem to make a dent in the level of demand for affordable units. An idea that's now been pressed into service is called Inclusionary Zoning, IZ, which the city just adopted and, if approved by the province, would kick in next year. With us to explain what it is, who pays for it, and what it can deliver, we welcome, in Pickering, Ontario, Garima Talwar Kapoor, Director of Policy and Research at Maytree, an anti poverty nonprofit. And in the provincial capital, in Little India, in Toronto's East End, Mark Richardson, Chief Technology Officer of Rich Analytics and the technical lead for the volunteer project Housing Now TO. In the financial district, Lori Payne, Executive Vice President at Osmington Jarofsky Development Corporation. She was formerly Director of Development for the Toronto Community Housing Corporation. And in his ward of Toronto St. Paul's, which is where this station is located, there's Josh Matlow, Toronto City Councillor, and it's great to have all four of you on our program tonight. I want to start, I guess, with just a bit of a fact file to bring our viewers and listeners up to scratch on what IZ, inclusionary zoning, actually is. For example, as passed by Toronto City Council, it means that 5 to 10 percent of condo units built around designated protected major transit station areas, those units would need to be affordable. And the range has to do with where it is in the city. So the highest percentage being downtown, the lowest percentage Scarborough Centre. That would increase to 8 to 22 percent of units by the year 2030. What does affordable mean? Well, affordable in this case refers to targeting households making between $32,000 and $91,000 a year. And of course, depending on the size of the unit, it could cost $800 for a studio monthly to $1,850 a month for a three bedroom. And affordability must be maintained for 99 years. That's the 411 on IZ. And now we want to get some feedback on what you folks think. Lori, we're not the first city to try this. Uh, there have been other cities uh, to try it, but we're the first in the province of Ontario to try it if it in fact happens next year. What do you think about the effort Toronto's put forward here? Well, first, before I answer your question, I just want to say that I've been working with the building and land development industry for the last six years, and we absolutely support creation of affordable housing and inclusionary zoning. To answer your question, what we don't support is the Toronto program. And the reason for that is unlike any other city across North America, Toronto has done a program where the full cost of those inclusionary zoning units is borne by the new home buyer. There is no financial offsets or incentives for the developer to provide that unit from any of the levels of government. So, in other words, if this were a social good that governments thought was important to achieve, they should be putting some money where their mouth is. Absolutely. This is a societal responsibility. We as Ontarians all have a role to play in creating affordable housing. Okay, that's Lori's view. Garima, you want to come in here and tell us what you think about that? Sure, absolutely. You know, I, I, I find Lori's comments really interesting. In my view, the debate about inclusionary zoning is a debate about who belongs in the city of Toronto. And so far, you know, we like to think that Toronto is this welcoming place where people from all walks of life can, can live, work and play. But what we've seen over the past several decades is that people with modest incomes are being pushed out. And so, you know, in response to what Lori is saying that, you know, the, the cost of, of new affordable units being spread out to other new home buyers who won't be uh, living in these affordable units, I think is a bit of, um, is, is shining a light away from the reality of how costs are being distributed and what, and what the analysis behind inclusionary zoning has held constant in terms of which variables will change. And so, you know, um, um, developer profits aren't one of those variables that will change as a result of, inf of inclusion inclusionary zoning and, and market analysis that the city has undertaken has held that. And okay, so this, hold, hold this their is agreement. a decision point. Yeah, Got sure. you there. Okay, we'll, we'll dive into some of those items that you brought up as the discussion continues. Mark, uh, how about your take on this particular IZ effort by the City of Toronto? Uh, we spoke at council and we are generally supportive of the moderate way that the city is trying to approach it. 
Uh, inclusionary zoning is not Viagra. It's more like insulin. You need to uh, moderate the dose and make sure you're doing a bunch of other things. Check your blood sugar, eat right. Um, the city has tried to create a program here where they're not really putting any skin in the game themselves. And that makes it hard to create affordable housing units at the speed and scale we need to in the city of Toronto. They have other programs like Housing Now, where they are generating more units faster because the city has skin in the game. Uh, Mark, I think I get your metaphor, even though we are a family program, and I'm, I think maybe you could have chosen a different one, but that's another story. Anyway, moving right along here. Uh, okay, Josh, I've purposely left you for the end because I wanted you to hear what everybody else had to say about the city's efforts. You were obviously involved as a Toronto City Councillor in the debate. How do you line up on this? Well, you know, the, the development industry has proven that they will price what the market can bear. And, uh, you know, many cities uh, throughout North America have inclusionary zoning policies that have percentiles that exceed Toronto's. Uh, so, you know, this is, if anything, a cautious uh, start as far as what we're doing. Uh, Toronto has been asking the province for several years now to allow us the tool to use inclusionary zoning. And the reason why is because I, along with my colleagues, hear, without, without exaggeration, every single week from residents who cannot afford to live in the city, are being priced out, uh, have given up on their dreams for home ownership, and struggle to even make rent. Um, what your backgrounder didn't say earlier was that along with the condos, there's also going to be a small percentage of purposeful rental that will also be part of our inclusionary zoning policy. But inclusionary zoning is one tool in a much bigger toolbox that we need to use to be able to address the housing crisis we're experiencing. Uh, we need an entire toolbox that also needs to include the Ford government returning um, rent control on new units being built in the province of Ontario for rental. We need more uh, and better community housing. Yes, as Mark said, we need to move forward with housing now and use public lands to provide more affordable housing for more people. We need, uh, you know, uh, I think a, a, new, uh, uh, a new assertive effort by the federal government to uh, go back to models like cooperative housing and other opportunities for affordable housing that also builds great communities. And so many other tools in the toolbox, including, including reforming the City of Toronto Act to allow for buildings that have fewer than six units to Gosh, I'm be involved jump in, in our rental replacement. I'm going to jump in here because I, I appreciate that the toolbox has got a lot of different tools in it, but the, tool, the tool we really want to talk about today is the inclusionary zoning one and, and how influential you think that can be and, and, and again, how, who's going to pay for it at the end of the day. But you raised something there about what you think the province needs to do. Yes. And so I want to follow up with you on this. Is there any doubt in your mind that the province of Ontario will allow you to do this? There, there is no doubt in my mind that the province is already allowing us to do this. I only wish that it wasn't as restrictive as it is to 500 meters from a transit station uh, or that we have such low limitations on, you know, uh, on the percentiles that we're considering. The, the, the province has been supportive of moving forward with inclusionary zoning, um, but, um, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, I wish that we had this a decade ago. We would have had another twenty to 30,000 affordable units in the market today. So they, they haven't indicated that they're opposing what we're doing. In fact, they've been very supportive. Okay. Lori, your first comment was you like the idea, but you don't like the fact that the costs associated with it are going to be borne by the other people who basically take up the units in that same building. If that approach is not to your satisfaction, what would you have preferred to see? Well, I've done a lot of affordable housing programs and all of them work based on partnership. And so we'd love to see that the city takes a greater partnership with us in delivering these units. Could be that they're uh, waiving development charges associated with the affordable units, just as they do for their housing now units. It could be that there are increases in density that uh, provide an offset to the cost of providing the inclusionary unit. In fact, there are parts of the city right now that are really subject to exclusionary zoning where there isn't development permitted or a significant development permitted in order to protect uh, single family homes. That's an area we can open up through the right planning policy at the city level to encourage more 
housing of all types and all affordability levels. Let me get some feedback on that. Garima, waiving development charges or increasing density, letting the developers build more and higher in order to uh, help subsidize uh, the haircut they're going to take on those affordable units, if I can put it that way. What do you think of those two ideas? You know, I think that that offsetting things like uh, density charges or or incentivizing further uh, development of density um, asks us to again ask Toronto residents, Toronto taxpayers to bear the cost of of those things and given that inclusionary zoning is restricted to protected major transit areas um, there is already you know public investment in ensuring that where these units are going to be built are 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 uh, highly sought after highly valuable lands and so i you know i disagree that that in a market like Toronto, in a housing market like Toronto, that further offsets need to be provided to developers to develop the type of affordable units that we're talking about. We're not talking about deeply affordable units. We're talking about affordable units for people with moderate incomes. We're talking about early childhood educators. We're talking about new graduates. We're talking about people who have really helped to keep the city going during the pandemic. And I, you know, I think that at some point, especially as we try to build an equitable recovery post pandemic, we need to reconsider uh, what we all do and the role that we all play in, in strengthening a healthy housing market. Okay, Mark, how about your take on those two ideas put forward by Lori? Essentially, on the housing now sites, that's what the city is doing. The city is radically upzoning its own lands near transit stations. It is providing the deferrals on property taxes and on development charges. Uh, and I think the problem is that the number that Councillor Matlow and a lot of other councillors don't lean into enough is the 99 years. 99 years doesn't mean we're building this building one time. It means in 40 years, that building's getting a major refit. In 80 years, that building's getting a major refit. And we know from TCHC buildings and private sector apartment buildings that those costs, those state of good repair costs have to be covered. Otherwise, you're in a very serious uh, failure situation in 40 or 50 years. Up until the last couple of years, the city of Toronto was only doing 15, 25, 40 year period of affordability, which is only one life cycle of that building. Uh, Montreal does more inclusionary zoning, but they're only doing it for periods of 20 to 25 years. 99 years is a hell of a long time, and it is underestimated what the impact of 99 years is on the viability of a building. Okay, Josh, can I get you to respond to, I guess, three things now. The city opted not to waive development charges. It opted not to increase density for developers to help them subsidize the affordable units. And then you just heard the criticism uh, that Mark put forward as well. Um, okay, fire away. Well, uh, I think so. On the on the last point that Mark raised, I think he actually raises a very reasonable point. Uh, but it also is important that we secure, you know, a much longer uh, term than you know. 20 or more years, but, but you know, 99 years actually makes sure that we are looking not just for one generation, but for future generations of Torontonians to be able to afford to live in our city. You know, I, I've heard this sort of, um, and I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to uh, be derogatory about that sort of that, that request, but it, it, it feels like a straw man argument every time I hear the development industry uh, just say, well, you know, the consumer is going to end up having to uh, be, you know, paying more and that the city should just, you know, give and give and give uh, to supplement uh, this uh, this need. I mean, we all, we yes, we need to work as partners, but it shouldn't be uh, the, the average Torontonian, uh, you know, having to subsidize the affordability of this city. The reality is, is that, uh, as was said earlier, we invest a lot into social services, infrastructure, transit, parks. The development industry will make a ton of money. The question is, will they make a ton of money or just a lot of money? Um, you know, even if Councillor Layden's motion, for example, had been approved by council to accelerate and ask for more out of inclusionary zoning, there are still suggestions by city staff and our consultants that 
uh, that the development industry would still see roughly a 15% profit margin, which is really good on investment. You know, the, 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 whenever we regulate, whether it be, uh, you know, the restaurant industry or any other industry, when it, when it comes to health and safety, when it comes to supporting people's lives, um, you know, I think society is, as a whole reasonably understands that there are needs to do that. When it comes to housing, it should not simply be f a financial commodity. It also should be a right. And we need to make sure that more people have access to affordable housing. All right. Let me go to Lori on, on that observation from Josh Madlow. You haven't made the sale yet, Lori, so I'm going to give you one more chance here. Uh, he's basically ah. saying it's not fair for the average Torontonian to have to subsidize the affordable units in your building. The other people and you can subsidize it because you're getting such a great deal and you're going to make so much money off it anyway. Your response? Well, I, I love that you raised the issue of fairness. And I, I would say it's unfair to have new home buyers, those trying to get into the market, bear the cost of uh, inclusionary zoning. And what really happens is we need to make some profit on a development, and typically it is around the 15% that Councillor Matlow raised. And that profit margin is required by the banks, in fact, in order for them to finance the construction process. Development is a high-risk, long-term, complicated process that requires uh, some profitability in order for the banks to take on that risk. If we are unable to achieve those profits, then development simply stops and those homes get, don't get built. That, in turn, will exacerbate the problems we already have facing the city, which is far more demand for housing than we are able to supply. Every year, we are getting further and further behind in supplying the needs of Torontonians and residents of Ontario with, with new housing. Uh, Increased legislation, increased costs, labor supply issues are all challenging the supply of new housing, which is creating the overall affordability problem that everybody is facing, including those that would qualify for inclusionary zoning units, but also including those that don't qualify that would be buying the market units that are now going to go up in price in order to absorb the additional cost. Okay, I'm seeing some head shaking, so I'm going to give the head shakers a chance to come back here. Josh, go ahead. Yeah, a, 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 quick, a quick rebuttal, uh, respectfully. Um, I've heard this argument before, but the reality is that this isn't a hypothetical debate that we're having. The reality is that over the past couple of decades, there I don't know of another city that has been providing more supply of housing uh, than Toronto. There are condos being built all over the place. Uh, there are, you know, we often talk about how we've got more cranes in the sky than any other city in North America. So it is just false to suggest that there isn't a supply being created, but there is a supply of really expensive housing and it's getting more and more expensive. So it's not a debate again about whether or not prices are going to continue going up. The development industry has seen prices going up year after year after year. It's not hypothetical. It's happening today. More and more people are priced out of the market. What we need to do is ensure that at the very minimum, a percentage of those new units are not at luxury prices, that they're at prices that more people can afford. And as I said earlier, admittedly in long form, it's only one tool in the toolbox. This is not going to solve everything, but it will contribute something meaningful to the market that more people can afford and not have to leave our city. Okay, Garima, can I get you, though, to speak to the issue of, uh, that Lori did raise, which is to say, if this is a social good, as defined by the City of Toronto, the City of Ottawa, the Province of Ontario, the Government of Canada, if it's a social good that helps everybody, why should government not have a bigger stake financially in this? You know, government is playing a huge role in the development of affordable housing. The, the federal government has a 10-year national housing strategy where it's investing over $70 billion over the course of 10 years. Now we can have a separate show about the nitty-gritty of that 10-year strategy and, you know, the, the pros and cons of that strategy. But to suggest that, that the federal government and the municipal uh, government, the City of Toronto, is not investing public dollars to build affordable housing 
is just not true. That money is being spent. But the value of those dollars risk being eroded over time if we don't shape the rules of the game. And a tool like inclusionary zoning helps to create the rules of that game. And, and that's the fundamental purpose of inclusionary zoning is to, I think, essentially protect uh, the value of public investments that are being made, not only in housing, but across a litany of social services. Okay, Josh just referred a second ago to the fact that there's more cranes in the skies of Ontario's capital city than any other, any other city in North America. And I've also heard from the next person I'm about to quote that there's more cranes in the sky at Young and Eglinton, this one intersection, than in the whole city of Boston. So let's That's hear right. from Jennifer Kiesmat right now. She's the former chief planner for the city of Toronto. We had her on the program a couple of weeks ago uh, talking about her new venture. She's a, she's a developer of affordable housing now. And she tweeted this last week. Some council supporters of inclusionary zoning voted for it with nefarious intent, with the hope that it is miscalibrated and will constrain new housing supply in the city rather than facilitate affordable housing. Let's hope staff nailed their due diligence. And she hashtags it unintended outcomes. And then a second tweet immediately thereafter, this is not speculation. They literally said so on the floor of council with no shame. Okay, Josh, a quick response to that, if you would. Yeah, um, I, I heard that said by a member of council during the debate as well. And I think it's just absurd. Um, we should not be uh, using this tool uh, to uh, prevent housing being built. Um, what we should be doing is using this tool to ensure that affordable housing is created. Uh, but like, you know, I think you alluded to, Steve, at Young and Eglinton, which I represent much of the area, we also need to ensure that services, infrastructure, and parks keep up with the pace of growth so that people who do live in the area today, but also those who we, who we welcome as new neighbors, have access to public schools, have access to affordable childcare, et cetera. And, um, and that's where a lot of the public investment's going. So in other words, all these services, infrastructure, parks, et cetera, we, Trontonians, are paying out of our taxes and other fees to contribute to the success of all of these developments. I mean, these developments also rely on the ability for people to have a good quality of life. So we are working in partnership in that respect, whether or not the industry perhaps uh, recognizes the enormous investment that the people of Toronto are already making. Let me put forward now, there's another graphic coming up here. City Council passed what it calls a communications campaign to clear up what they describe as misconceptions about what inclusionary zoning means. Uh, for example, it, it won't stop development of new homes or exacerbate existing challenges. The costs, they say, will not be passed on to the buyers of the market rate units. And this campaign also suggests that it won't affect overall housing supply. Let's get some feedback on that. Mark, how uh, legit do you think that uh, communications campaign is? I think communications is vitally important around uh, inclusionary zoning. I mean, we do not work with private sector developers. Our volunteers only work with not-for-profits. 90% um, of not-for-profit affordable housing developments in Canada fail at the viability stage. Um, and I think people need to understand that there's no discounts for the building an affordable housing unit, even if you're a church group. Um, you still have to pay the same dollars for cement. You still have to pay the same dollars for windows. You still have to pay the same dollars for plumbers. And one of the challenges in the communications around inclusionary zoning and around affordable housing is frankly a lot of made up math. And it's been interesting to see the change in Jennifer Keys Matt from Jennifer Keys Matt city planner to Jennifer Keys Matt, somebody who's actually trying to build affordable housing in the city of Toronto. And she's understanding now that, you know, I think she was on your show the other week and she said that she has her head in spreadsheets way more than she did when she was city planner. We need way more staff at city planning and counselors, frankly, who understand that $350 a square foot construction cost is the same for an affordable unit by a not-for-profit as it is for a private sector developer. And therefore what? Therefore, we need to, what we've done on the Housing Now sites, you know, we took a nine-story building in City Place that was proposed in 2016. It went out to market. Nobody could bid on it. 
They couldn't even get the CMHC to finance it. Last week, council approved it at 29 stories with 50% affordable housing. You go from nine stories to 29 stories, you supersize your fries on every building. That's what makes the affordable housing math work. Okay, Lori, your take on the city's communications plan to make people, in their view, see the bright side of inclusionary zoning. Well, I think one thing with all of these communications, what they're missing is nothing is free. There is going to be a cost, and that cost, as I mentioned, is going to be borne in two ways. One, that the cost will be passed on to the new home buyers of units who, um, those buyers that don't qualify for a subsidy or for an inclusionary unit. And if they are unable to afford a unit, um, then those homes simply won't get built and we will exacerbate the supply problems uh, that we face in the GTA. And there's been a, quite a bit of talk amongst the panelists about supply. Um, I think it's worth remembering that we have projections and have received 110,000 people moving to the GTA every year. That requires that we build on the order of 50 to 55,000 homes a year. Our peak that we delivered was in 2003 at about 43,000 homes. And we are continually getting further and further behind in supplying homes to the market. That is causing an increase in prices along with increased costs of construction. Um, and we really need to focus on getting more supply of all housing types, include, including affordable ones, into the marketplace as quickly as possible. Garima, do you, first of all, I, I, I should say we've done enough programs on this that I believe Lori's numbers are correct, that we are therefore falling farther and farther behind as the years go on and as more people move in here. Does that not argue for as much creation of new housing in as many different forms, including through the use of inclusionary zoning, as possible, in your view? You know, I think... I, definitely we need more supply. I think that that question is out there. But the type of supply that we need to develop is the fundamental question. You can develop a, a ton of, of housing units, but if they are priced at people who have, who have wealth, people with very high incomes, who can afford to buy multiple units as, as rental properties, you'll still have a housing market, but it's not an inclusive housing market. And that's what the fundamental question that we're talking about is, is you know, it, through inclusionary zoning, can we start to develop the type of supply that is necessary for the average person in Toronto to be able to afford to live here? Let me ask you a follow-up then on this, because yeah. I, I presume that private developers are already charging for their units as much as the market will bear, right? They're not charging less. They're charging as much as they can possibly get. So again, this is a question about the math. How can prices of the affordable units get passed on to and subsidized by people buying at the market rates when they're already presumably paying the highest price possible for those market rate units? I th that's a very good question. And I think it's, again, you know, if developers, when they choose to sell their units, choose to not bite into their profit margins and offset that cost onto new home buyers, you know, that is going to be facilitated by the type of owners and people who can afford to pay an incremental cost on, on housing because they, they expect that the value of those units is going to grow over time. You know, the industry has had decades to demonstrate demonstrate that without this type of zoning criteria, that it could just naturally, by virtue of the market, develop affordable units. In 2020, 2,700 purpose-built rental units were developed. And out of that, only 4% were deemed affordable units. And so if that, you know, that's the market working as, you know, without any type of constraints in terms of, of affordable um, inclusion. And, and that is what, you know, the counterfactual of what reality has shown us that the market is willing to supply in terms of affordable units. So, you know, how the costs get distributed, I think it's important to remember what Josh was saying earlier, that these arguments tend to be strawman arguments. And I think the proof will be in the pudding as we move forward.
but it's, you know, what we have before us in the city of Toronto is not something that is extremely bold. It is an incremental step. No, I appreciate a that. A courageous but, step. But, but I in, just, an incremental uh, step. and I'll, I'll get Josh to comment on this. I, I just want yeah. us to have truth in advertising here, which is, which is, I think the following, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong on this. The development industry is going through a wonderful time right now because this city is just on fire and people want to build here and people want to live here. And mm -hmm. is it your view that developers should simply have to take a bit of a haircut if they want the privilege for developing in here? They therefore have to subsidize out of their profits um, more affordable units. Is that your view? Yes, like I said earlier, they're either going to make a ton of money or just a lot of money. They've been doing very, very well, far better than most industries. Uh, even, you know, during the pandemic. And, you know, the reality is, and to kind of summarize this, it shouldn't be a debate about housing supply because I think most reasonable people agree that we need to provide the supply that will meet the demand for people moving into our city. The question is, A, whether you have two, two people in a neighborhood or two million people in a neighborhood, shouldn't everybody have access to social services, infrastructure, parks, everything to contribute to a quality of life. We have not met that yet, and we need to. B, um, shouldn't the people who are moving here and people living here today have access to more affordable units, not just a supply of high-priced units, but more affordable units? So it's moot to suggest whether de the development industry is going to make it really expensive or just really, really expensive. It's already too expensive. It needs to be more affordable for people. And I think what this debate really comes down to is more ideological. There are some people who are arguing from the industry, from the provincial government and others, that, you know, from a neoliberal uh, Reaganite uh, supply and demand perspective, just if you build, 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 uh, it'll the market will take care of itself. And then there are those of us who recognize that there needs to be some regulation in our market when it comes to health, when it comes to safety, when it comes to housing, when it comes to providing people with a good quality of life, to ensure that there is part of this market available to more people because it has not been successful. This is not hypothetical. Over the last two or three decades, well, we've had a housing boom. We've had a lot of supply, but not enough of it has been affordable to so many people who are being priced out of the city, and that's a fact. And this is where the host jumps in and says, I know you all want to comment more on this, but that's our time. So I say thank you to Mark Richardson and Garima Talwar Kapoor and Lori Payne and Josh Matlow for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views. Thanks for this very civilized debate. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.